Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. Take a little respite this week from the Maryland Crab Cake Tour. We were planning on divisional round playoff activities, but I'm sure we'll get out to State Fair as well as El Guapo and the Beaumont, some other places. Uh, now that the Crab Cake Tour has taken full precedence, the Ravens will not play football again until September the 10th of uh, this year. Uh, obviously a long, long way to go. A long week and a long month ahead in Owings Mills. Luke Jones joins us now. He will be there cleaning out lockers this week, um, trying to pick up the pieces of whatever happens with Greg Roman, whatever is going to happen with John Harbaugh's staff. I, the Lamar situation is not going to become clear, but I'm sure, I'm sure some team sources are going to leak some information. Some players are going to leak some information to some agents so who are going to talk to some people like you and me and other people. So it's going to be a lot of news coming out of this. But uh, And most of it won't be good, Luke. I mean, this is really um, – this is the tough, tough side of the business and the tough time for the franchise and certainly the heavy lifting for John Harbaugh in the aftermath of all of this. No doubt. And, I mean, it's just – it's frustrating because it is really crazy – as much as you and I have talked about this for weeks, as far as, you know, certainly without Lamar Jackson, not thinking that this was a serious Super Bowl contender. And we had our doubts long before the Lamar injury, as far as just how viable this team could be. And not not in being able to make the playoffs, not in being able to win the division, but winning, not just winning a game in January, but winning multiple games in January and seeing what Cincinnati, what Buffalo, what Kansas City looked like. And, you know, for me, it was always a thought of, well, I think they could beat one of them on the right day. And boy, they came close. And as much as we focus up on the end of the game, you know, what happened with Huntley at the, at the goal line, obviously, what happened on the final drive and the time management, and James Prochet almost making a miracle catch. How about the end of the first half? You know, the Ravens had the ball at the three-yard line and they couldn't get seven. You know, they had to settle for a field goal. They get the ball to start the third quarter. And they go, what? They get one first down and have to punt. And then the Bengals drive down the field. If you recall, there was a third and one where Roquan Smith had a chance to to get Joe Burrow down and, and for, get them off the field. And it didn't happen. And they, they ended up scoring a touchdown. So think about what that kind of swing could have been. Had the Ravens gotten seven to end the first half, going into halftime, instead of a one-point lead, you know, they put another touchdown on the board. And then you're, you have the ball to start the third quarter. They could have, yeah, you know, they could have really seized control of that game, but they couldn't. You know, it's another what if in a season of so many what ifs. Uh, but you know, you move on; it, it ends quickly. The suddenness of the end of the season when you're in the playoffs, even even if there was a little more resignation around town uh, than normal in terms of you know, the Ravens' realistic chances without Lamar Jackson and just knowing what the state of this offense was uh, at the end of the season. Well, the amazing part is if they win the game and we're here today talking about them going to Kansas City as a 16-point underdog this week, would would Lamar play? Yeah. Right? I mean, like, they, they will feign that maybe he would play because they lie about such things. But that is fascinating that we would have had another week of is Lamar getting better? I mean, this, yeah. is this is a chance to go to a championship game. If you go out there and beat Patrick Mahomes, you would think that that would, that would appeal to number eight. You know what I mean? That would have been, that's all hypothetical at this point. It's not meant sure. to be, but I'm sure the franchise will pitch it that way that, Hey, Lamar, one more week, maybe Lamar could have made it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, th that's what was so interesting about his, t his tweet on, on Thursday evening. That to me, and again, he didn't say it. He didn't spell it out directly that I'm done for the season. But the details that he offered on his injury did not give off a vibe that his return was imminent uh, to, to lay out the scenario that you just presented. We don't know. And again, what the team says. And it what was more like, is. I'm not here and I'm not coming. I, I mean, it just, you know. It and the fact like that, it, that Harbaugh apparently was a little blindsided by it or a feign that he was. Oh, I, I, they didn't know about it. No, they, they they didn't know he was tweeting that. But for here's and here's how you know this for sure. I mean, I know that they didn't know that. But even if you're skeptical of Luke Jones saying that, think of how the Ravens handle their social media. Anytime there is a statement from someone, they do not just type it out. What do they do? They have their social media team, their graphic design team. They put up a fancy little graphic. It's got the purple background with the white lettering. They would have put out statement from Lamar Jackson. And it would have been 
a nice, clean update. Probably wouldn't have had that level of detail. But even if they had made an organization organizational decision to say, hey, Lamar wants people to know that this is how injured he is, and we don't want to damage our relationship with him any more than it might already be, that's what, how you know they didn't know that that was coming. And certainly – you can I imagine. would wonder from his perspective where the damage is. And I never, you never know when someone feels disrespected or put down or put away. But I really wonder at what point this thing got awry for him. That would be an interesting part of the book. He doesn't talk mm-hmm. to most of anybody. Maybe somebody down in Miami will get the story at some point or somebody in Louisville or, you know, or Bill Roden will get the story. Because I saw Harbaugh light up and smile from a podium i'm like who is who was the pretty girl that walked in it turns out it was bill roden uh mm-hmm. you know once i saw everybody get up and clean out of the locker uh out of the tiny little interview room in cincinnati that i've been in all i don't know 21 22 23 times in my life um not for a playoff game though <laughs> never thought about a playoff game in cincinnati yeah. at the podium but th- there this the truth will come out it, it's too young it's too fresh like one of my wife's soups uh, you know, got to let it settle, let, let it settle in, let it meld a little bit. But boy, this last month has been one of the uglier episodes undocumented so far for, for, for the, for the franchise, because it never got here with Ray Lewis or Ed Reed or John Ogden go down the list of Suggs, Suggs, who was a nut. And they, they figured it out with him, let alone the Marshall Yandas and the lunch pail guys that it, that spent time here. I mean, they even figured it out with Jared Johnson by just being honest with him and saying, dude, we don't have the money for you. Go get paid in San Diego. Like the, the lack of trust and or trust or trust. I'm not sure either way. However you spell it. Um, the honor and the integrity of the relationship will be the heart of this story. It won't be Lamar's knee. It won't be his ability. It might not even be money. As much as it's respect and as much as Lamar has watched them fall apart without him, in his mind, that is his bargaining chip. I mean, he doesn't know anything about being an agent. Like, I, you know, like he really doesn't. And and that's you don't know what you don't know. This unrepresented part has done him no favors. And it certainly has done Eric DaCosta in the organization no favors that this wasn't better managed, better orchestrated, and that involves Chad Steele and whatever they're going to put out at the podium and whatever Michelle Andres is going to put online, what, whatever the orchestration of all of this is. It's it's very unfortunate, Luke. I mean, I, I, I just want to say it's very, very unfortunate that this is the circumstance the franchise is in and they can't sell their tickets and people are all up in arms and everybody has a strong position that may or may not be accurate. The only strong position is he got hurt, didn't finish the year, and they got eliminated. And they can't win without him. I mean, it's just, it is wild. Regardless of how you want to dice up the blame. And you just you just name some individuals where, you know, the Ravens have had mess, messy situations in the past. And that's where I'm not going to look at this as it's a closed book and, and they can't work something out. I've, I've seen... I've seen it happen before, whether you're talking about the Ravens or you're talking about elsewhere uh, with players, contract situations. Luke, However, Luke, I don't think the Ravens want to work it out anymore. You know what well, I mean? I, like, I'm like, I'm starting to believe that. Oh, that, I'm not, that, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that that isn't necessarily the truth. But my point is I'm not going to say never say never when you are talking about a position and a player who is that important to what they've done the last few years. And even if you make the decision to move on, it's still very complicated moving forward because you don't want it to be a case of you're not going to get proper compensation for him. So again, even if they're heading toward a divorce, even though, you know, they were, they ever really married when you're not talking about a long-term, you know, $200 million contract, they still have to play nice and they still need to be cordial and, and try to handle things publicly the best way they can. But it is wild when you really take a step back. And again, wherever you fall on the Lamar versus organization scale, to think where they were three years ago at this time, you know, this was right around when they lost to Tennessee, uh, when they were 14 and two, they were a 10 point favorite to the, against the Titans and they were completely stunned. Even in the aftermath of that, you think about where the Ravens were at that point. They had a, a quarterback who was 22 years old, about to be the uni- unanimous NFL MVP, 
led the league in touchdowns. This offense was the best in the league, better than Kansas City that year, yes, even though the Chiefs ultimately won the Super Bowl and the legacies are defined in January. But we know how great that team was in the regular season. To think they are where they are three years later and over the course of those three years, Nestor, one playoff win, it's it's incredibly disappointing. And, and that's not even pointing the blame at any one individual. There's lots of blame to go around. There's lots of rotten luck to go around, quite frankly. Bronny Stanley doesn't crush his ankle uh, you know, uh, midway through the 2020 season. Uh, you know, go down the list of different, you know, all the injuries they had last year. I mean, if Lamar doesn't get hurt each of the last two uh, Decembers, what does that mean? Does that, you know, not saying the Ravens would have won the Super Bowl, but certainly would have been a, in a better position than missing the playoffs entirely last year and being knocked out in the wild card round this year. You'd like to think they certainly had a higher probability of you know, making a run either of those two years. If Lamar's on the field, not you know, that's a captain obvious statement there. So it stinks. It really stinks that they're in this position three years later. And there's plenty of blame to go around. And the organization owns a lot of that. You know, even if, even if you are of the thought of, Lamar's not this, or Lamar's getting hurt, or Lamar wants too money. You know, go down the list of, you know, his critics, you know, his detractors pointing out certain elements of it that might be fair or a little unfair. You know, the organization, you know, they they dropped the ball at some point uh, <laughs> uh, along the way here. You know, uh, whether you're talking about wide receiver or, you know, initial offers of Lamar that they gave Lamar two years ago. Did, you know, did they lowball him then? And it kind of got this thing off on the wrong foot. And as you're, as you pointed out, the absence of an agent being the buffer, I mean, it makes things messy. It makes things complicated. And, you know, as much as this thing looked great and awesome three years ago, and, you know, it's not as though it's been all bad over the last three years. Let's be clear about that. But, you know, to see where it is now, it's, that's, that's sad. I mean, it is when you think about what kind of transcendent talent he is and, frankly, what little the Ravens have done with it beyond just winning games in the regular season. So that's not to say you automatically give him what he wants or you automatically trade him or, you know, however this is going to play out. Again, expect anything. I think anything's on the table other than the Ravens saying, oh, well, we'll give you a fully guaranteed deal. I think after another injury plague season, I, you know, that wasn't hap happening anyway, which was evident last year, but clearly that's not happening. So I don't know how this is going to play out uh, and how it ultimately finishes, but to go from where they were in early January of 2020 with a team that looked almost unbeatable. I mean, I mean, they won 12 games in a row and they just racing teams. They were embarrassing teams. This look, this was the best team in football going into the playoffs that year. There's no question about it to think where they were then and to think where they are three years later and, you have one playoff win under your belt to show for it. That's incredibly disappointing, no matter who you want to blame for that ultimate outcome. Luke Jones is here. He will be uh, continuing to try to interpret all of the changes out in Owings <laughs> Mills. He'll be there for locker clean out this week. Uh, we will look at all the games, look at the Final Four, talk about, I mean, this weekend, a while, super wild card activity and stuff. I mean, the Bills almost got beat by a third-string quarterback. The Bengals almost got beat by a second-string quarterback. We talked about the Bengals' offensive line being decimated. Three-fifths of their line now out in the last couple of weeks, including the other night with uh, uh, they lose the left tackle. And the tournament will go on. We got, let's see, four, two, seven more games left, right, you know, at the end of all of this. There's no more 1 o'clock. I said to my wife, there's Sunday 1 o'clock over with until September 10th now because uh, they sure. moved all these games back. So the routine ends and the off season sets in and people start thinking about spring training or the Turbs or the Caps or, in my case, Bruce Springsteen, um, you know, or whatever the, the off season would be. This week, and the tumult with Roman moving chairs, whoever Greg Roman's buddy is that's about to get the head coaching job at wherever and what job he would want and how Wink Martindale is still coaching football this week and the rest of them are not. Um, th this is – and then Bishotti, right, who – I'll be honest. I never thought Steve Bishotti was going to take my press credential and be a jerk. But here we are. So I, I don't – Brian Billick didn't think he was going to get fired that day, 14, 15 years ago, whatever. 
He owes John Harbaugh 30, 40 million dollars, probably still, right? I mean, on the contract, maybe 50 million dollars for three, four more years left on Harbaugh's deal, whatever it is. This is a time where the, the, the fire Harbaugh people like my buddy Joe Enoch, the people that hate John, and I've already brought John some flowers because they were in a football game with a backup mm-hmm. quarterback on the road where everybody's hurt and they have, you know, they almost won the game. I mean, I don't lose sight of that with John. But it certainly feels like we're a lot closer to the end than the beginning with John. The clock management issues, Greg Roman's his guy. The place calls are his guy. The, the, the guy's popping off his guy. Chad Steele chasing media. That's his. His name's on the on the door, and it feels to me like he's real tired. And watching this, and I'm not watching it in the room with him anymore. I've been in a room with him once since June, and I'm watching this as a fan, as an interested observer. You're in there watching the sweat, and I'm thinking to myself, "Hmm, I wonder how he and Eric are doing." I wonder how all of this is doing because this would be the time. I mean, the dude that won the Super Bowl last year with F those picks five days ago was talking about maybe I'll go to TV. You know, I does John want to bring in another quarterback and hang out here another five years and try to do this all over again now that he's quit on this kid or this kid's quit on him or there just needs to be a divorce because – Steve comes in at this as the billionaire guy whose franchise has picked up $150 million of value, uh, you, you, you know, in, in the last month. I mean, this thing is accelerating in an in incredible pace. He just picked up $600 million of free money from the state. He's having trouble selling tickets. He's got a disgruntled quarterback, a beleaguered coach, a chased off offensive coordinator, a hiding in a hole general manager. And they just signed Roquan Smith. I, I like all of the reset the, that Steve would want. How Steve wants this managed. That Sashi Brown sits here and Chad Steele sits there and Eric sits over here. And all of that is up for grabs too right now. Because Steve comes in and decides he doesn't like any of it. That's going to be Steve's prerogative. So I never lose sight of that. If Steve's going to make changes, this is, Steve doesn't fire coaches in week 12. You, you know, th- this is the time of the year for Steve to say, I got all this money. I don't want to sell the team anymore. Because there was a period during the plague where I thought Bishotti was going to sell the team. So mm-hmm. did the people around him. Doesn't feel like that now. And then maybe he's playing coy. But th- this isn't a time of evaluation for the whole franchise. And I think Steve will be taking a long view of that. Because it certainly feels like the end of Camelot to me, to some degree. There's one word, and I, and I don't want to dismiss the rest of what you just said, but there's one word that you said that really struck me. You used the word almost. And this is where, look, I think John Harbaugh's credentials speak for themselves. He's a Hall of Fame coach. He's been to the playoffs more often than not. He's had two losing seasons and you look at those two losing seasons they were 2015 and last year when they were absolutely rocked with injuries so i don't need to sit up here and you know recite john harbaugh's credentials however here are some facts this team has now gone a decade without making an afc championship game appearance think about that i mean think about the fact that in john harbaugh's first 5 years they made three of those. Now, they lost in 08. You know, they lost in 2011, the Billy Cundiff game. And then they had, you know, they had their their revenge. They had their, their ultimate gratification, their ultimate validation. You know, John Harbaugh had that. So, you know, but you mentioned the word almost. And that's where we kind of go back to how these guys, you know, they play hard. This the, the floor is very high, right? I mean, they've had a very high floor. They won a lot of games in the regular season and they've made the playoffs. But as I mentioned in a previous conversation, this is now uh, out of this period of time where they've made the playoffs for the last five years, they've been one and done three of the, three of those. Now I'll point out in 2019, that, that was the divisional round. They got the first round by that's something that should be mentioned, right? I mean, you, you shouldn't just gloss over that, but they, they won playoff games <laughs> in 2008 through 2014 they won at least one playoff game each of those 
six years that they six out of seven years they made the playoffs on the road as i remember those most of them on the road correct correct i mean in fact it was crazy sunday was the first time in in franchise history they'd lost a road wild card game you know every other wild card game they'd played on the road they'd won so I pushed buses out of Indianapolis that morning. Right. I, you know, like I, I remember Pittsburgh. I remember that eight hours back with Billy Cundiff and, uh, you know, like that, that, that we've been up and down the highway and, and Harbaugh has been a part of all of this to your point. So is the Costa, right? Uh, every so, bus ride we've been on, they've been on. So my point is not to say that that means I think the Ravens should fire John Harbaugh, but there has to be an acknowledgement here that it's been a lot of almost and not a whole lot of doing it when it comes to January and when legacies are more ultimately defined here. Now we can talk about elements of law. I mean, my goodness, you had a quarterback sneak play that turned into a 98 yard fumble recovery for a touchdown, whether Tyler Huntley executed the play uh, correctly or not, whether Greg Roman should have called that specific play or not. There's a, a, a very rotten luck element. That's yeah, a hell that of a was, bad beat. I would right, agree. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, whether you get, you know, normally, okay. But he stuck. was running and, and Andrews was chasing him and four guys could block Andrews. And I'm like, are any of you going to take out 89? Turn around, take right, out it, the only guy that can catch him. And I thought that he almost got him. I mean, get more Almost Andrews, the block in the back. Andrews play defense. You know, a block in the back, could, you know, kind of sort of could have been called there too. But but the point, the point is you, you, know, you can – only keep talking about almost so long until you start to say like, you know, what gives here? We're spinning our wheels. Why, why isn't this translating? You know, it's great to win these games in the regular season, but got to break through. And that's not to say that's one specific individual's fault. Uh, it's an organizational thing. You know, it, there've been personnel questions, you know, whether you're talking about wide receiver or last year, not being covered at left tackle adequately for Ronnie Stanley or you know, go down the list. You can talk about coaching decision. My goodness. I mean, we've broken, you know, we picked apart Greg Roman over the last couple of years. You talk about John Harbaugh with fourth downs and two point conversion calls at the end of games and clock management, as we saw that rear its ugly head at the end of the game. You know, you can talk about Lamar Jackson or this defense, not protecting late leads or what, you know, I mean, go down the list. It didn't it's- rear its head at the end of the game. It reared its head to end their season. Yeah. yeah <laughs> right. I mean, so- literally. Sure, sure. So, you know, and and I guess my point in saying that is not to say that they need to clean house, but I think if you're Steve Bashotti, you do have to look at this thing in a big picture sense and say, okay, are we continuing to move in the right direction? Whether we're talking about Lamar Jackson or the coaching staff or the organizational philosophy. I mean, I, I mentioned the revolution and Lamar Jackson and medieval running the football and, you know, and, and doing all those things. Do they need to take a long look at that? You know, and, and we can talk about wide receiver and say, well, wide receivers don't want to play here. Well, why is that? Right? I, I mean, you know, you have to, you have to. It's a fact, be, though. That's a you fact. You have to. Well, sure, but you have to be introspective because wide receiver is important. <laughs> look at the teams that are still playing, other than maybe the Giants, which, you know, I, well, that's it really it. becomes important when you're down ten points. You know what I mean? Yeah. When you fumble the ball, you get a kick block, you're losing ten to nothing. All of a sudden, the way to matriculate the ball is to throw the football. And we watched it all weekend. Teams that complete forward passes. And sure. this isn't that team. Steve sees that. John sees that. Eric sees that. They went in this direction. They called it an experiment in the beginning, yeah. which always left the open to say it was an experiment. So yeah. I can see them dealing Lamar off to the Maybe. Buccaneers for three first-round draft picks, let the Buccaneers guarantee him $210 million, and them coming back and saying, look, we tried it, and here's why – we love that kid. Here's why it mm-hmm. didn't work. He got hurt. He ran into linebackers. We couldn't get wide receivers to come and play here, and we just decided it was an experiment that we tried it. It was a lot of fun. Wasn't it a lot of fun? Can't you hear John mm-hmm. say, wasn't it a lot of fun? You, you know, but but we're going to do something a little more traditional now and, like, try to throw the football. Yeah, but then that's where I do go back to everything else about this, and we keep saying the word almost. Has has the track record been so overwhelmingly great since Super Bowl 47 to say that, all right, this current regime gets to start over again with another quarterback? I don't know. I'm just presenting that question. I've never thought clear. that Steve would want to look for another head coach. 
because it was painstaking for him. As much as he's a hirer of people, he doesn't like hiring people. From what I can tell, he doesn't fire a whole lot of even people he should fire, including the people who threw me out of the building. So they don't move anybody out there. Nobody moves out there. It is a very – it's the strength of the organization is it's, sure. is the stability and the way they keep people around, right? So knowing all of that, I've never felt – I, I, my, my thought three years ago was Steve was setting this thing up to sell it and mm-hmm. saying to the owner, I got Eric DaCosta and Ozzie Newsom still in the building and, 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 you know, and we have tickets sold and he, here's my new team president, Sashi Brown. Here's mm-hmm. my, you know, I'm giving you a $5 billion organization that's functioning, you know, so, so give me my 5 billion, let me cash out and I'm done. Right. Steve doesn't, isn't done now. Right. So if Steve's in, and Steve's not an old guy, right? I mean, Steve's got 20 years of life, good yeah, life. He's not left 90, in, right, yeah. Right, like like the next thing, his next John, his next consigliere that he puts in that chair, at some point, he's going to outlive John in the deal now, I believe. He's going to still own the team when John's not coaching it anymore, or John doesn't want to coach it, or he doesn't want John to coach it. But I've never thought that he's wanted to, to find the next guy. Yeah. And they're at the point now where they're going to have to find the next guy at quarterback, right? I mean, are we all – I mean, I'm not sailing Lamar down. I think it's more relationship and trust and, mm. than it is whether Lamar can play or not because Lamar can play, and they're going to struggle without him. But I don't think they can go on with him because I don't think he's going to play for a tag, and I don't think they're going to come up with a contract, and I don't think they trust him Yeah. because he didn't yeah. play Sunday night. And, and, and so – so all of that being said, this is in Steve's mind now. Do I want to blow the whole thing up? How much longer am I in? Is John really the guy? Are we going to bring in a – are we going to get bad and draft a rookie quarterback and, like, go that route? And, like, because th- this is a time for big change for them. I, I I don't know what – big change might not mean John. It might not mean Eric. It might – it's certainly going to mean Greg Roman. It's almost right. certainly going to mean Lamar Jackson to some degree. I would wonder if Steve doesn't sit down with John and say, D- D- you know, do you want to go coach another team or do you want you know, like, are we in this for another one of these? Are we going to go draft another Lamar and do this? Because th- this beating Joe Burrow and beating Patrick Mahomes and beating Josh Allen and beating the gig. and beating Trevor Lawrence, they better, the gig. They, they, they better be better than what they are right now. I just, that's the job, right? I mean, that's what, and, and that's where I, you're saying the word almost, and, and I'm not trying to fixate on that, but it just, it really struck me. You saying almost, and you meant it in a complimentary fashion. I mean, again, very few people gave this team any shot on Sunday night. And I mean, they were a foot and a half away, you know, a foot away from taking the lead in, in the fourth quarter. I mean, Look, I don't even like John, but like I, I picked 37 to 16 and felt guilty. I felt right. like, I, I just thought he would throw a couple of picks. I thought the defense would get beaten a few more times over top. That's what I thought. The fact sure. that the game was where it was in a 14-point swing on a really dumb play and a bad decision by a second-string quarterback uh, with, with your franchise running back on, the, on, on, on ice, like, I bet Steve's not happy this morning, right? Like, I, I just started to think, I bet Steve's not happy. I wouldn't think so. I certainly wouldn't think so. But But, again, that's where – keep coming back to this and you just said it with these quarterbacks aren't going away uh, i mean now could there be an, could cincinnati screw up their situation with joe burrow because mike brown's notoriously cheap sure i'd say that's possible uh, but it's not going to happen with all these guys right patrick mahomes is not going anywhere josh allen is not going anywhere i mean you can stop with those two and, and just what we've seen out of those two franchises over the last you know especially kansas city but buffalo to a lesser degree but you know, I mean, we saw the playoff shootout that they had last year in Kansas City and how close the Bills were at that point. But, you know, the gig is not to be almost. The gig is to you got to break through. And if you are in a position, for argument's sake, that let's assume, and again, I'm not making that 100% assumption, but I certainly feel it's more likely than I would have certainly a year ago, <laughs> absolutely from two years ago, that the Lamar Jackson relationship is coming to an end that's what they called it experiment whatever you want to call you know the revolution whatever (laughs) if we're if we're making the assumption that that is 
going to come to an end here. And again, I'm not saying it definitely will, but would it surprise me? Of course not. I've seen the same thing everyone else has seen uh, play out over the last few months uh, in the last two years, really. But it, how do you get, how do you break through? You know, how uh, is it going to be, a, is it as simple as, boy, you need to, you need to find the next Joe Burrow. You know, is it as simple as, boy, you need to try to be able to draft Bryce Young. And I'm just throwing his name out there just as an example. I'm not saying that, you know, whether he's going to be a, a stud in the NFL or not, but he's going to be a very high pick. I mean, that, you know, uh, the number one pick and all that, but you know, it, that's, that is what's tough about this because they've had, they've maintained such a high floor and, you know, p- people have even talked about this. You see a lot of people, you know, smart Ravens fans, you know, blogger types, you know, media you know, X's and O's types talk about the Ravens formula compared to less need in the Rams where, you know, it was blank those picks. And, you know, we see where the Rams won a Super Bowl last year and they're terrible this year because they yeah, their head coach injury. almost said F this job. Yeah. I, uh, by the way, uh, as a, a quick aside, I love how the Rams put out the statement <laughs> that Sean Fay was excited about returning next year. Yeah. Nothing says excitement. Like I need a full week to figure it out. If I want to coach next You're year, you're going to pay me 12 million. I guess so. I guess yes. I'll come. So, and, but, but the point is, you know, when you look at this thing, no, close is great or is good to a point and it's great to compete every year. But if you feel like you're, you're really not getting over the hump and that feels like where the Ravens have been the last few years. And look, if Lamar Jackson had been healthy the last two years, who knows, maybe the Ravens would have made an improbable March to the Super Bowl. Let's face it in 2012, you know, I talked about this recently Go back and look at the end of the 2012 regular season when they played a similar season finale in Cincinnati. No one thought the Ravens were going to the Super Bowl at that point. There was much more talk about the fact they had lost four out of five. So you never really know. And maybe that's the argument that the Ravens could make for saying, hey, we're in it and, and on the, you know, we've been on the fringe at the very least every single year for how many years now? But almost is not the gig, right? Almost, you know, it, winning Super Bowls and getting to AFC championships and, Getting to the Super Bowl, I mean, that's that's what this is about. And look, let's be very clear. Take a step back. You know, let, let's touch the touch some grass for a moment and realize how good Ravens fans have had it, how good Baltimore has had it for two decades now, two decades plus uh, the number of playoff appearances, two Super Bowls in the last 22 years. I mean, don't take that for granted. Let's be very clear about that. However, if we're looking at it over the last decade, there have been fewer. You know, they have two playoff wins since Super Bowl 47. They have one playoff win since January of 2015. And you say that with them having a unanimous NFL MVP at quarterback in 2019. So you know, why hasn't it been more successful in January? Steve Bashotti should be asking that question right now. And that doesn't mean he cleans house. Let's be very clear. But you better be introspective about why almost is as good as you're doing right now, you know, in terms of almost winning in the first round or almost beating Buffalo. Well, I don't think the fan ago. base believes either. Right. And Steve doesn't know any, I mean, Steve, Steve's on a boat drinking expensive wine, living on his yacht down in the Bahamas. He doesn't know. Maybe he does. I mean, he's a smart guy. Maybe he's driven around, but I've lived here. I remember we didn't have a team. I remember we brought a team. I remember the first time. I remember the second time. I remember the road to the second time. I remember Oh six. I remember the passion of this city and they screwed that up for life with, with people like me. I mean, they throwing me out of the stadium. So, but I see empty seats and I see flamingos that aren't on lawns. And I see people like me that have a hundred sets of purple floodlights that didn't make their way out of a bag. There was no confidence for this team in the community. I've been out in bars and restaurants all week. No, nope, nobody's, painting the town purple nobody believed that's a real problem for ownership yeah. now whether they acknowledge that or not sashi brown what the hell does he know he's off a boat he thinks this is good because he's getting paid and he's new to it and he's got a seat and he's got a job for as long as he how as long as contract is at this point right like but steve doesn't think of these residents in general sashi brown thinks he's got a job for 20 years because that's the way steve operates and they better get moving as much as I've beaten the baseball team up here for two decades. Off season, there is no off season. And that's not just for Eric DaCosta. That's for selling their brand and the mm-hmm. spirit of the brand and getting people excited. 
and to your point, when you don't win playoff games, when you fight with your quarterback, when ticket prices go up, when you treat people poorly, and I'm not the only one that's been treated poorly. I get reached to every day by somebody who's been treated poorly by the Ravens. And I don't mean taking a knee in Wembley and I'm mad because I love Donald Trump. I'm talking about people that feel like the Ravens have drifted, not just in the way they've treated me or they're getting their $600 million of free money and like all of that. Just they need some kumbaya time with their fan base and a reconnection, a re-engagement of their fan base locally in Baltimore to bring back that level of Billick on billboards or we've got Ray Lewis or we've got this transcendent quarterback who doesn't play in December and is mercurial at best and maybe wants to leave at worst, right? So this is an episode for Steve to and Sashi, who's now the leader, and Eric and John, who are the leaders, they don't think anything about the fan base or the fans or what the, they just don't. I mean, they they, mm-hmm. they don't. I've been a part of this. I remember when they cared what the fans thought. Now they just put a pretty social media status thing up, put it out there and and flagellate themselves and feel like they've done something. They've won two off, two playoff games in a decade. That's on John. That's on Eric. That's on Steve. That, that They can't give their tickets away. That's on the franchise. And all of this should be baked into whatever they're doing with their quarterback, whatever they're doing with their coaching, whatever they're doing with their brand strategy. But their brand's taking a little hit. Beginning with Ray Rice and the Wembley knee and, and losing playoff games. And John's demeanor is just poor. Like, you know, it's like just literally as a guy watching it, I look at it. He looks like a guy that might not be my head coach anymore because he doesn't look like it doesn't look like it's fun. It doesn't look like it's uh, engaging. And it doesn't look feel like he's recruiting anyone anymore. It feels like it's the building against the world. OK, that's who he is. And if that's what you want from your head coach, fair enough. But it's costing them in other ways. I believe that. I see that and I feel that when I walk the streets in a purple hat and by the things people say to me when they come up to me, as I'm as close as they're going to get to Steve Bishotti. Or, they, they don't get a chance to talk to any of them. So when they run into me, they talk to me about this stuff. And I see the, the $5 tickets on game days. And I see that nobody went to Cincinnati. On, I, I couldn't have put a minibus together to go to Cincinnati on Sunday night to see that. So this is this is on Steve's desk, Luke. And, you know, I know you're more football. I'm more business and wherever it is. This is where it all. This is where you shape the organization. When sure. Steve calls Eric and John and the leadership to Jupiter in three weeks and sits down and says, what are we doing here? This is this is a bad I mean, they made the playoffs and it feels like there's tumult. You know, it, it, it does not. It doesn't feel like good times there. It feels like some major changes are about to happen in a lot in ways maybe we're not even talking about. Yeah, I, I mean, a couple thoughts, and then I do want to mention something as, as a retort to that from a football standpoint. But one, got to remember this this franchise has now been here 27 years. You had people in their mid 30s who the Ravens are like the Orioles were for you and for me. They were just always there. You know, they, they were an institution. Yes, we know that the St. Louis Browns moved in 1954 and became the Orioles and all that, but they've been there. They're they're absolutely, I, I do think this fan base is spoiled a little bit relative to how bad it is in some other places. I mean, again, you talk about some, you talk about some cities, some franchises uh, that have had a, a team way longer, you know, even, even longer than the Colts being in Baltimore. Look at someone like the Detroit Lions, for example never even been to a Super Bowl, let alone one, two in this millennium. So there's, there is some of that. And I do think there's just some that I think there's ebbs and flows to that in any market. I think at times new England Patriots fans are way more spoiled now than they were in the mid nineties. That's for sure. (laughs) Thinking about what that franchise was. Oh, you're thinking about old tired coaches and quarterbacks. I mean, how long is Bill Belichick going to continue to do right? I mean, he looks a little old and tired and beaten up and sort of like, and I see all these young coaches, right? And I'm not saying sure. John was the young coach, right? Mike Tomlin was the young coach. Sean Payton was the young coach. They're not anymore. And I, I don't know. It, it, from watching it from where I'm watching it, it just seems like it that, that they've they've lost the fun. They, you yeah. know what I mean? They, they, they've lost that. Well, and 
I mean, and, and to bring it back to Lamar Jackson for just a moment, look how much fun he had his first couple of years. And, you know, he, he had such a youthful countenance, right? I mean, he was smiling. He had so much fun. I mean, we, re- we remember him, you know, he'd bump into a photographer on the sideline and he'd get up, and, you know, it helped the person up, make sure they were okay. And, you know, even, or even a couple of accounts where he sent a, a private message to them on Twitter. Hey, are you okay? Stuff like that. Not to say that Lamar doesn't care about knocking over photographers on the sideline anymore. My point is he played with, it was such a, I mean, it was so rejuvenating after, you know, the last few years under Flacco had not, been very fun and i'm not saying that that was all joe's fault either it was just how it played out for the franchise but you know i one thing i did want to mention from a football standpoint because we've spent a lot of time talking about what's wrong this team has an all pro cornerback whether you like him you know whether you personally like him or not nestor because i know you've talked about marlon humphrey he's a great player mark andrews one of the two or three best tight ends in the nfl ronnie stanley is back healthy and looked like Ronnie Stanley from the time that he came back. And and that's encouraging. Uh, They just signed Roquan Smith, who for my money is the closest darn thing they've had to Ray Lewis at, at inside linebacker since Ray Lewis, better than CJ Mosley, better than Patrick Queen, go down the list, better than Daryl Smith. And they invested a long-term deal in him. So it's not as though the cupboard is bare at, at all these other positions. They have a lot of talent. However, you're talking about your offensive coordinator, you're talking about wide receiver, which whether the Ravens track record or not, it's a very important position. Look around the league. And most importantly, you have such an unsettled situation with your franchise quarterback. Boy, it's really tough to just try to focus on all the things that are going well and to just overlook that because you can't. It's that important. So, I mean, it is difficult. I, I think, I mean, at least in, since January of 2008, when the Ravens were looking for their next head coach after Brian Billick was dismissed, I mean, it's difficult to recall a, an offseason that's going to be more pivotal than this one. What exactly is going to happen here? Greg Roman being fired. I mean, to me, that's that's the baseline. And I don't say that with disrespect to Greg Roman. And again, I've said all along, I don't think it's all his fault, but I just don't see how you don't make a change there. I think it's run its well, John's had seven or eight offensive coordinators, right? This is sure. not, I mean, it, I, I can't even remember them all. He was well, Zorn, uh, uh, Camp Cameron, uh, Tressman, Tress. Oh, I forgot about him. Gary right. Kubiak. <clears throat> yeah. So Zorn, Zorn was a quarterback's coach, by the way, not, not an OC. Oh, right. But. Okay. That's right. But he your point is, here. but Thank your you. point is there are lots of cooks and, and replacing. He thought co- he was the offensive coordinator. I'm sorry. Replacing, <laughs> co- right. Replacing coordinators. That happens all the time. You know, that, that's, I mean, I, I, I may, I tweeted at the end of the game on Sunday night that a, a really interesting off season now commences and people were saying, Greg Roman better be fine. I mean, that's just scratching the surface. And again, I don't say that with disrespect to the human element of Greg Roman, the person look, Jim Harbaugh becomes an NFL head coach again. He's probably going to join Jim wherever he winds up, which you know, will be interesting to see, but I mean, what's going to happen with Lamar Jackson? What is going to happen here? And do you tag him? Do you, do you somehow find a way to come to a long-term agreement? And again, I'm not expecting that whatsoever at this point. Why well, the would the tagging you? in part was always like, that's what fans on the internet say. Well, they, they, he's under team control. And that's what the announcer, he's under team oh, control. Oh, you're going to do that. And I'm th- like, great. What does that mean if if you're paying $50 million and what you've had the last eight weeks from a communication trust standpoint, if that's where – and I don't mean injured. I just sure. mean like, is he on the boat? Is he on yeah. – is, is, is he – Fully committed, and I know John wondered that out loud to some journalists privately back in the spring when he didn't show up mm-hmm. at OTAs. So I think this – when he didn't show up at OTAs, and we talked about it and said, well, it's just just practice, Allen Iverson. Yeah, just practice. Mm-hmm. And it's optional, and the Players Association have negotiated these terms. And um, right. that that got on the wrong side of John. In the beginning, I, I know that got on the wrong side of John, which got gets on the wrong side of the organization if you're on the wrong sure. side of John. And to your point, they're going to franchise him, and he doesn't have to show up. And I, 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 I just don't see that as – that's for fans on the internet. That's for the end of the bar. You guys at the end of the bar just say franchise him and play him. This isn't rotisserie football. I mean, it's not. And I've never thought that that was a legitimate channel – to do anything other than deal. 
I, I never thought he's – well, he'll just shit. It's $48 million. He'll show up. He'll play. I'm shocked he showed up for $23 million this year. And there were a lot of smart people that thought he shouldn't have. Yeah. Well, you're going to tag him because you're not going to just let him enter free agency, right? I mean, so it's it's – it very much comes back to what are you tagging him for? Now, the organization will say, assuming several weeks from now when we get to the window for issuing the franchise tag, the organization will say publicly, we are tagging Lamar in hopes of working out a long-term deal. And we'll have till mid-July to negotiate, and we know how that works because we've seen them tag players in the past. And everyone other than Matthew Judon, the Ravens have signed long-term. Uh, and Wally Williams way back when, which, you know, different business back in the late nineties compared to what we're talking Transition about Transition tags. Sure. Sure. So, but it's just, you know, it really does come back to, you know, do you give them the exclusive? And I, I'm not going to take credit for this. I, I saw Mike Florio wrote, I think it was Mike Florio, but others have talked about this as well. Is there a scenario where you give them the non-exclusive tag and you know what you say, but because with the non-exclusive tag, that means what he is free to negotiate with other teams. Do you give Lamar what he wants and say, you know what, Lamar, Assuming he still wants a fully guaranteed deal or nearly fully guaranteed deal, assuming that hasn't changed, and we don't know because Lamar hasn't talked about it and he doesn't have an agent to leak that information. But assuming that is the case, is there a scenario where you say, you know what, we'll give him the non-exclusive tag. It's cheaper. We are covered that if some team signs him and we either one can't match it or let me rephrase that. They can match. They could. They can do whatever they want if they really want to do it. But if they don't want to match it, they get two first round picks. However, if you do it from a strategic standpoint, if you're still thinking this is our franchise quarterback, as much as there might be certain things about him that you know we're worried about the injuries or whatever, but he's still our guy because we don't win games without him. Let's just say for a moment, that's how they feel. I'm not saying that that's the case, but that's the hypothetical. Is there an argument to be made that you give him the non-exclusive tag and you let Lamar, hey, Go call teams that are looking for a quarterback or let they'll call you and see what they offer you and then see if they give you a fully guaranteed deal, the deal that we haven't wanted to give you uh, over the last 10 months, you know, since the Watson deal. Uh, so, you know, that serves two purposes. One, you know, if some team signs him and gives them the deal he wants and the Ravens don't want to match it, they get two first round picks. But it could also be the reality check that the Ravens might feel that Lamar Jackson needs and some team offers him something that is not terribly different than what the Ravens have been offering. And again, I don't know that all it takes is one team to give you, you know, everyone was talking about the teams that were vying for Deshaun Watson until the Browns gave him a $230 million guaranteed contract. All it takes is one team. We know that. However, you do wonder if that's the scenario, maybe more so than the exclusive, maybe you give them the non-exclusive and say, no more. Go out and see what you're worth. Hey, the Ravens did it with Ray Lewis. They did it with the greatest, you know, the most beloved iconic figure in franchise history in Ray Lewis. At the end of the 2008 season, he became a free agent. He could have signed with anyone. We all know that. And there was all the whispers about Dallas at the time. Guess what Ray Lewis found out? No one else was pay wanting to pay him more than the Ravens were willing to pay him at the time. And he was 31 years old. Came back. Now, and, and again, I'm not suggesting that that's how it will definitely play out with Lamar. But if it's a case of Lamar continues to want a fully guaranteed deal, as is the assumption, then, you know, okay, let him go see if someone will give it to him. Because I do agree with you from the standpoint of with the tag, it's great to say you want to play it out from a football standpoint and say, all right, we'll bring in another receiver, have be better there, have a different offensive coordinator, and see what Lamar in this offense looks like then. That sounds like a that sounds like a very reasonable idea in a vacuum, right? But business involved is involved here. Human beings are involved here. And you're talking about a situation that's now festered for two years. Whether it's remained, you know, I'm not saying it's been uh, been ill will over that entire time. But at some point in time, just have to call a spade a spade. Why can't you get a deal done? You know, there's frustration. There absolutely is frustration for both sides. And you can understand that. But, you know, it's great to talk about that hypothetical situation. But that's where I do agree with you from the standpoint of, is it really plausible to just say you're going to play out another year for the tag? For, for on the tag, is Lamar going to be remotely amenable to that? I mean, if it's the exclusive, then okay, he gets 44, 45, what you know, and it's not set just yet because we don't know what the what the cap will be and all that. But does it play out that way, or does it get really? Uh, does it get you know? Forget about OTAs. I mean, <laughs> I mean that was 
that was a symptom of where the contract situation was at that point in time. Him skipping OTAs, if, if that's the worst that would happen after you tag him, boy, you'd sign up for that in blood right now. <laughs> you know, but is he going to show up for mandatory minicamp? Is he going to show up for training camp? Is he going to show up for the start of the season? You know, I made the assumption of late August. It's no guarantee. We've seen guys look at Le'Veon Bell in Pittsburgh. Whether he was wise or, or not doing that, guys will skip. You know, guys will show up. You know, we've seen guys show up in week three. We've seen guys sit out. So, you know, I, I have no idea how it plays out if you just say, oh, okay, we'll try to tag them and see what happens. And I'll go back to what I said to you before the season even started. And this wasn't even me being pro Lamar or anti Ravens or any of that. I, I said to you at the time, how exactly does this play out for the, that constitutes a win for the Ravens in terms of the, this negotiation? You know, it's fine to say you don't want to give them a fully guaranteed deal. I get that. I understand that. I totally understand that. Especially now after him having another season where he's gotten hurt and couldn't finish the year. But what constitutes a win here? I mean, if you're going to trade him, well, you're starting over at the most important position. You know, you draft Kyle Bowler, you know, the next Kyle Bowler, then where are you the next three or four years? You're the Jets. The Jets have a really good roster right now, except their quarterback position's a mess. Well, they didn't make the playoffs, so it kind of shows you where you are there. So, you know, that's a not an, an imperfect comparison, but my, my point stands. If, if you don't have it figured out with your quarterback, then all the other good players that the Ravens have on their roster and all the things about this organization that you really like, and there's still a lot to like, it's still, you know, I don't want to say it's moot, but boy, that stuff doesn't add up to feeling nearly as strongly and, 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 and as confidently about this organization as you'd like to feel. So until they get that figured out, boy, I mean, it's just, you, you think it was a, a dark cloud hanging over the 2022 season. How do you think this off season is going to play out? How, do, how about firing Greg Roman and, and saying, you're going to go hire an offensive coordinator who, you know, and he's, he's going to say, high... who's my quarterback? Exactly. What What's Lamar Jackson's deal? And it might be someone <laughs> who wants to work with Lamar. Let's be clear about that. I think there are plenty of guys out there who would embrace that, whether they're at the collegiate level or somewhere else in the NFL. I think there are guys who'd love to work with Lamar. But if there's no security there in terms of knowing if he's going to be your quarterback or if he's going to show up until September 10th, boy, how do you proceed there? So that's where I mean, you just look at this thing and I'm not, you know, it, I'm not saying the Ravens are doomed and are going to go two and 15 next year. That's not remotely saying that, but they, for everything they have going for them right now, until you get this situation resolved, it just feels like very little else matters. And that's, that's an unsettling position to be in uh, when you're going into a, a season after uh, a first round playoff exit. Well, we don't have to ask if they're going to sign Roquan Smith because uh, that was that was the big question a couple weeks they ago. They got That's, that done. They got that done. Luke Jones is here. He will be in always most cleaning out lockers this week. We will be, continue to discuss this at uh, playoff games. Dennis will be here on Thursday. I'm doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour presented by the Maryland Lottery uh, in conjunction with our friends at Window Nation. Lots and lots of things happening here, including a Super Bowl in uh, Glendale, Arizona in a couple weeks as well. Uh, seven football games remaining on the docket, including uh, – a chance to see uh, the Cincinnati's and the Buffalo's and Kansas City's and Jacksonville's get together this weekend and show us how it's done. I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. And we never stop talking Baltimore positive.